Life Audio. Today on Talk About That, John charms the lunch lady and makes a case for flying cars. Meanwhile, I irritate my teachers and put a tiny camera in my ear. Plus, a conversation about affirmation, kindness, and high school yearbooks. Today's episode is not sponsored by dogs, like cats, except they actually care about you. Buckle up, Buttercup. It's talk about that in 2023. What did you think we would be doing in 2023 when you were a kid? Could you, even, could you even fathom it? No. 2023. Because you don't really think like, you don't think of yourself in your 40s. It seems so distant back then. Like my kid right now thinks what did you I'm think, ancient. What did you think of a 40? That's what I was going to say. What, would you, what did you think of a 40-year-old? She you can't conceive of it. No. And she doesn't know that She I can't feel... believe you're still walking around. <laughs> You're not creaking as you move, which you do creak. You like, tend right, to creak. Like on the inside, she doesn't know I feel just like her. Like I feel like a little yeah. kid still. Like a little girl. No, no, just a kid. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting into some deep stuff already. Yeah. No, but yeah, there's a thing of like, I remember the year 2000 was a big thing. And you would see all these things in the 80s when I was growing up about like, there's going to be flying cars. And I knew that was a lie. Even as a kid, I was like, no, there won't. And here's why. If you get into a fender bender on the road, okay. If you get into a fender bender in the air, you all die. Yeah, but like, or, or it's the same thing as riding a motorcycle, isn't it? Like what, first of all, like how would you regulate a flying car? Like a fleet of flying cars, just random people. First of all, you got to make them affordable. But then you have to figure out, how do you track? Because they have to, like, flight plans for planes. You have to know right. who's taking off from where. You remember, can't just be like, I think I'm going to fly to the store real quick. Remember back well, the, no. What if everybody's going to the store and you run into them in the air? And why do you need to fly to the store? Right. Because you're way above everything. Remember Back to the Future, where they go to the future? Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. And they're flying. That's what it's like. It was like just random chaos. Yeah. But there were, like, little street signs and dividers there were there were little like were lights hovering. you're right yeah so we could so you're saying there's a system that you've come up with that you know my theory and i'm maybe a listener out there is some sort of scientist or developer uh-huh. or genius or elon musk or someone yeah. with a lot of funds but i really think the whole thing is about the earth's magnetism okay i think what you need is if you could somehow press against like counter magnet against the earth's magnetism at a certain rate if you could dial it in yeah then you really could just we have, hover you just hover yeah so that it could never fall i mean unless you step outside of the hover craft but yeah. that would be one way and then if you could dial in the earth's magnetism up and down like mm-hmm. you're not even then you can go higher or lower without really a lot of thrust I guys i think you need to work on dialing in your own magnetism <laughs> Because you've just bored our entire audience to tears. Has no one ever thought of this before but me? I'm sure there's people out there. Talk about magnets. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, th- that's one I knew would not happen. Even as a kid, I was like, this won't happen. You're such a cynic, man. And the other one was, people won't even eat meals anymore. We'll just take these capsules. Because I was like, we don't eat for nutrition. Even then I knew there's a lot of reasons people eat. <laughs> it's not it's like, I just need to get exactly right. the number of I calories need, and nutrition that I need. Nutrition. I can get it all in this one capsule and I'm mm. good for the day. I can go back to work. Yeah. Yeah. We it's, want to stop working so we right. can eat. Yeah. I want to. Yeah. I mean, eating is recreational, which yeah. is part of my problem. That lunch break when you're on, when you work a regular job, that lunch break is like an oasis. Are you're you, living between those. Oh yeah. When I was a know, teacher, shoot, man. It was everything. I mean, and they would car blow you in that cafeteria. Oh yeah, they're just and, trying to get you. And like, through I would the day. always be, I would always engage the uh, lunch ladies and find out what's going on in their lives. Sometimes you got I, engaged to a lunch lady? <laughs> no. no. I mean, Wait a minute. I don't know anything about Laura's background. This is fascinating. I, think it, I mean, let me tell you something. She would revolutionize school lunches, but no. So how would you engage the lunch ladies? Well, I mean, just hey, how's it going? Some of they share like. I stuff feel like going you're on. patting yourself on the back for just talking to like a commoner. You're like. I don't know. A lot of people wouldn't talk to the lunch ladies, but I was like, they're people, right? No, I wasn't like that at all. I actually cared about lunch ladies. That's a lovely hairnet, Lois. And like, I'd I'd like they'd ask me to pray for something going on in their family or whatever. Oh, what are you going to do now? You going to make a joke about that too? You think- You got nothing. Did they ask for the prayer or did you go, 
hey, anything I can pray for you about? Were you right know. looking for another scoop of mashed potatoes? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. They would load me up. Okay. But it was it wasn't I wasn't being kind. It wasn't a a, it wasn't like thing. a quid prayer quo. Quid. <laughs> <laughs> he just said quid pro quo. It was, what were you, that, you were trying to get an extra potato cake. If I had that speed. Or one of those like, uh, the yeah, the rectangular pizza. What about that rectangular those, pizza and lunch Not rooms? only were those my favorite, those were such my favorite that yeah. my mother-in-law, whenever we first got married, she uh-huh. knew how much I loved the square pizza. Even We called it square pizza. It's not square. But it was rectangular. We called it square we because are, in school we weren't learning about shapes, apparently. That's the problem. That's yes. what I'm saying. This shows the failure of the American <laughs> education system. We called that square pizza. Maybe so much square pizza. Yeah. Uh, it's square just like Nebraska. <laughs> no. <laughs> she bought me okay. like two sheets of frozen square pizza for Christmas one year. Really? Yeah. Where did you keep them? They're gigantic. Uh, I don't remember. We probably broke them into you smaller bought a, squares. You bought a chest freezer just to <laughs> house the pizza. It was awesome. That's when I knew I'd married into the right family. So, That's funny. No, they would load me up at lunch, man. And that, four, I think it was fourth period is when I would come back mm-hmm. after having so many mashed potatoes. But what's the and productivity could, level after... Hold. Teachers always talk about that. The productivity oh, level after lunch just goes it's, to through the floor, if right? If you're in my fourth period class, I meaning it's lunch period like... That's a great class to be in. It's longer mm-hmm. because I'm going to amend, maybe. Yeah. Because I'm I want to hurry things up because I want us to get to lunch faster, and then I want us to come back. So to teachers lunch are thinking slower. about it too. Not even educationally. You're just like, I got to get to lunch. I got to do this, and these kids are literally on the gravy train right now. Yeah. Like they're going to benefit from being in my fourth period class. Yeah. If you come back, I'm like, you know what, guys? You don't think about your teachers when you're a kid. About their them having lives outside of you, but as an adult, I think now I go, gosh, I was really hard on my teachers because I was a class clown kind of, and I would just make yeah. snarky comments because I'm trying to get no. attention or I'm trying to be just a goof. But I'm insecure, and I'm sure I derailed a lot. I got a lot of zeros for the day. No, you, you ever get one of those? Oh yeah, yeah. And I don't even know if those add up. Maybe it's the reason I. I'm where I'm at. I thought that you... I averaged a zero. No. Johnny, zero plus zero is zero, so don't worry about yeah, that. Nothing from to. nothing means nothing. <laughs> I really thought that you would have been more of a, not a rule follower, yeah, but more of a, I don't want to disappoint the yeah. person in leadership. It didn't happen a lot, but there was times I couldn't hold in the thing that I needed to say mm-hmm. and make the cool kids laugh. Yeah, The cool kids didn't hang out with me after they laughed. Right. They were just like, that's a good one. Hey, Let's not hang out. You stay on your side. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, there was sometimes I would just have these, th- and I still, that's the thing. That's the reason I do what I do. But you do, you have these thoughts as a kid and you go, oh, this is so inappropriate. It's like the church giggles. Mm-hmm. You have to say it. Some people don't say it. I said it. But I got a, I remember getting, I remember them saying to me, you get a zero for the day more than once. <laughs> Different teachers. <laughs> Or like uh, permanent record, that was a big threat that oh. we got as a kid. This is this will go on your permanent. See, record. I tell my, I never got that threat, but I, I, I wonder if there. Where is my permanent record? You, Wouldn't you love to I'd look love at to it? See it. Gosh, I did find my uh, senior, sorry, my junior uh, year uh, yearbook. Yeah. The other day and read because I was I cleaned out the garage for two days. Two days. It was bad. Yeah. It needed a lot of reorganization, mm-hmm. and there were several goals. One is to park three cars in there. People don't park in their garage. I, I want to park in my right. garage. Like we grew up not having a garage. I like to park in my garage during bad during three winter car, months. Three cars, huh? My mom lives with us, so yes, I park her car in there. Mm-hmm. And also the exercise equipment for my wife and daughter. Yeah. Even though we have a treadmill that nobody uses, and I hate treadmills. I want to run outside. Yeah. But they use the weight bench. You want to run outside just from seeing a treadmill? Let me out. You me, run yeah, from I just the treadmill. Get away from it. Yeah. So I have now. It, it was a lot of Tetrising. But yes, yeah. I threw a bunch of stuff away. But yes, mm-hmm. but in that I found, not only do we have all the exercise equipment and the cars now, and you can, it's fun. But you found but the found old yearbooks. the old yearbook. And that is probably what our, that's what permanent records really are. You don't yeah. really care about your grades now. You ca- Did you look through it to see what the other kids wrote in it? Was oh, that part of your journey? Yeah. 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 I want to yeah. see what they were saying. Because I have this whole theory that that hindsight is nothing like 2020. It's a horrible expression. Oh, no, no, no. It's terrible. You don't remember yourself accurately We've talked about that before. There was an interview that I listened to, and it was a guy that's talking about his experience with his therapist, and they said that your childhood memories are not what you think, whereas like, it's like pulling a book off the shelf, looking at it, and then putting it back. In fact, it's way worse. When you pick up the book, you've altered it. 
you've made changes to the book and then you put it back. So the next time you pick up that book, it's an it's altered version the, of that. Yeah. Every time you touch the book, you're rewriting it. And those of us who are extra introspective then have rewritten a lot. Yeah, or you're making yourself more of a hero or more of a villain. Yeah. Or more of a neutral party if something really bad was happening that you don't want to admit you were part of. You're like, yeah, but I was just there. You're protecting. You're the press secretary. We've talked about that before, about how in your mind, you're more of a press secretary defending. Uh-huh. You're giving the the tarted out version of what happened. You're going, well, look, right. there were a lot. There was a lot yes. going on. Yes, I'm going to take questions. I'm going to take questions eventually, but let me get this right. out. Yeah, right. <laughs> right now, there's still an active investigation. And, yeah, uh, we cannot comment on that. But what did people think of you? Like, what, people expected you to be successful, right? You were class president, Johnny. That's Let's a, get that out of the way. That's a big enough question. You were on the success train. You're on early a big on. enough a series of questions that it's going to require us to take just a short break. So we'll be right back. Johnny, what is success really? <laughs> is that what this this is the start of the essay question? Uh, of, I know. What is success to you? <laughs> if I wrote an essay on success in high school, it would have been well written. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. You know what? What I got was I don't. I don't want to. I don't know. I'm. I'm very. I'm feeling. I'm feeling a little uh, seen. A yeah. little vulnerable. Okay. I don't know if I want to say all the things. Mm. Um, Do you feel like you've achieved? what people in your high school thought you would achieve? Man, I think about that sometimes because is that, I... Because the truth is it doesn't matter at all. You don't have contact with these all. people. Um, we always... Pe- teachers always... That's another thing teachers always say. You are spending all your time trying to impress these people that you will never see again. Yeah. Please don't do it. And you can't get out of your own head to no. do it. You can't listen to that. You can't know what you don't know. Well, because you you have no choice but to live among the peers that you have. Right. In every season of life. It's like people try to tell me, stop hanging out with John. You're not going to see him right. ever again once you, your inevitable blood feud. Right. And I don't listen. You never do. I still feel like I, I'm making moves to like, oh, I wonder what John would think of this. You know what? Who cares? Who cares? Because whenever you and I fall out. Yeah. Well, oh, it's going to it's gonna be big. We're going to have like 250 awkward Recordings yeah. out there on the internet. But, yeah, they're locked in carbonite. Yeah, it's like wow, those guys like used to be good friends. Mm-hmm. And now that's it's a John now pain- just slash Johnny's tires. It's a painful right. PTSD every time I listen. Ugh. I'll be a subscriber and a patron, but you got to because I want to know what you're saying. You, we'll have separate rival podcasts oh goodness, like, to talk crap about each other, like talk and that. And yeah, like yeah, they're on separate networks and everything. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, it'd be amazing. No, I I often look back. What really haunts me, I think, about those days is I was known as the Christian kid, even mm-hmm. at a Christian school, because yeah. I would speak in chapel, right? And I had like, I would share my faith a lot. Um, I look back at that and think of it as very inauthentic and insincere. Um, and I, I, I do. I'm real hard on that high school, John, and a lot of it was because I had all these these false equivalencies and false humility and all these other things about, you know, about, especially with girls and everything in those days, you know, we were not in a, I I was not being taught about dating and things, the same thing. My parents were giving me good advice, yeah, but like in other places, I wasn't getting great advice from the church. Um, well-meaning, but just a different age, you know? And so I found myself in a lot of bad situations and I look back and go, wow, what a hypocrite, Mm -hmm. you know, to have these technicalities that you adhere to. But then the truth is though, Grace actually teaches me that whatever I was saying about God or not saying about God was not made more or less true by my own actions. I would rather be a a, a better reflection, but honestly, the things they wrote, who's going to write, hey, you're a big jerk and a hypocrite. That's true. They're signing your yearbook, so they're not going to write a hateful thing. But there was a lot of things written there like, hey, you know, really appreciate your your influence kind of thing and feel like you're sincere. I was like, man, and and I look back and go, I probably was sincere. Yeah. That's really pain. Why is that so painful for me to say? Yeah. I want to paint myself worse. Mm-hmm. And the truth is like, Grace says you don't have to do that because you could be like, look, it just was what it was. Yeah. And I don't know if there's anyone who's truly insincere in high school. Like you know they're what, probably all sincere. <laughs> what's interesting about the yearbook is we stopped doing that thing. It's a great, we've talked about ritual before and tradition and how we, we spent a lot of our background in religious culture trying to almost escape that. Like, 
uh, we'd hate the, all the weird uh, walls that we put around God. So we're going to be the church that lets kids wear tank tops to church, or we're going to be the whatever. And we're not going to do all the weird religious stuff that this other church does. But sometimes like tradition and liturgy, like it has a real, like, I was thinking when you said that about the yearbook, we stopped doing that, but it's almost a way people talk about give people their flowers while they're still alive. Yeah. That's a way to do that. And we stopped doing it. Like we should have a yearbook every year. Yeah. For adult life. Cause like, you know how I feel about you. We talk about things and we're very open. We're such mama's boys. And we just like, yeah. our emotions are right on our sleeve and for better or for worse. That's just how I live. I'm very easy to take advantage of because of that. Like, I feel yeah. like there's a, people see me coming like, all right, well, I know how to make Johnny feel insecure because he's already told me all of his hot button issues. Yeah. Like I just have friends that just know how to do that to me. <laughs> but at the same time, I feel like, uh, yeah, we need more of that in life where like people, I've heard of people who know that they're terminal and they have their funeral yeah. in advance or whatever. So people can say what they want to say about them while they're still alive. There's like a whole movie about that. What was it called? I think it was called Get Low. And Robert Duvall was in it. And it's a true story. It's based on a true story about a guy who was going to be dead in a year. So he's like, I want to have my funeral now. And, uh, but yeah, a yearbook is that thing where it's like, you get to see the esteem. When I left Home Depot, it's the closest thing. When you leave Home Depot, you have your apron and they take your apron and they sign it. I forgot about that. You still have it? I kept it. Wow. Even though that was like a job that I could not wait to get out of. Yeah. And I didn't feel like I had a ton of great connections there. But in a way, when I saw that apron, there were people who signed that and wrote like nice things uh -huh. that I was like, I didn't think that person even like knew who I was. So that was kind of cool. I think the problem with it being annual, even though it's called an annual, yeah, is, you know, the reason that junior and senior year stuff, a lot of seniors are writing to me who were leaving is that it's a shift out of a season. Yeah. Um, for example, my teaching years, which weren't many, I taught for four years mm -hmm. before I went into full time other stuff. But like, there was one of the teacher admin trainings at the central office, and they did a drawing, and they gave away a Blunt County Schools mug. Yeah, and it says "dedicated to the service of children" on it, and it's all faded. We were going through and purging all the cabinets. It was just a big purge at the house, man. Right, and she goes, "Let me guess." We're going to need to keep this Blunt keep County this, Schools mug. Sure. And I was like, absolutely, because it, it just reminds me of a formative season. Uh -huh. You know, like that was important. Those years were important. I mean, I'm still so involved in history and stuff because of, right. of, of that path that I took. Um, and I've looked back with over the with fondness over the kids. Sometimes I'll see a few of the kids on Facebook and all that. They'll reach out. Hey, Mr. Driver, what's going on? You know, I think you know, sort of some totems not for the purpose of elevating and, and that's why I don't really care. You know, I'm, I'm curious what people thought of me in those days. It doesn't really matter. Um, but more like finding some appreciation of those days for what they yeah. were like. It's, we're so, yeah, maybe we you should do it at the end of a season of something, not necessarily every year, but like, yeah, you should take like, I don't know. Yeah. You should take a moment be like, Hey, we're all going to meet at Buffalo Wild Wings and we're going to talk about how we feel about each other. <laughs> Well, you know, I used to make the kids in the leadership And they'd be like, uh, uh, I gotta, I'm not going to make it. I'm not. So you and I would do it. Nobody would go. We'd be like, I am there. I will say I've had dads do that when their daughters are getting married. You and I both have been part of those things. Yeah. Where they're about to gain a son-in-law. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite. Instead of all the things they, they know about you and are great, right. they want you to come in and speak things into the new son-in-law. Right. You know, like, hey, you know, this here's is... Here's a blessing or here's a... Right. Welcome. A challenge. Right. We're... If you hurt her, we're all going to hurt you. That kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that... Remember the old overdrive retreats with our student leaders? Uh -huh. I would often make them stand in a circle at the end. And it's so cheesy. Like you said, no one... Oh, wants, right. I remember those. No one wants to show up for this. Mm -hmm. If you invited them to Buffalo, it ended up being usually their favorite thing. They would eye roll... Just yeah. moan and groan until I got them started within 30 seconds. It's, hey, I want you to take, you know, just say just say nice things about each other. Yeah. Find something to affirm that's real and true uh -huh. about the people in the circle. Yeah, don't like just, don't you just wax flattery if it's not real. But right. Make some, you can think of something good to say. Yeah. And it's such like a, it's an exercise. In fact, I was on a call this morning for a, a possible book that I'll be doing with some people I've written with before. And they were talking about that in marriage. 
specifically like the how a lot of men feel mm-hmm. that that like affirmation for men in marriage and I'm not meaning to be stereotypical this is not right. it's, it's men and women alike it needs to go both ways just for their story this is what they were talking about uh-huh. that like it it would it would transform his life yeah for her to be like hey I I see I'm not just seeing all the things you're not getting right yeah like the, I, I'm, I'm actually cheering for you, and, and I believe in you. Mm-hmm. And I think for it doesn't. I'm not sure it's male, female, husband, wife that matters, but I think that's just human. Yeah. And I think that we think that that's inauthentic because you're waiting for that to happen organically. And some of us do that more organically. You and I are more prone to be like, "Hey, man." Yeah, you know, but I'm not. I'm not great at it with my. No, you're not. I'm, I'm so. not great at it with my wife as I could be probably, because yeah. you just assume like, well, she knows all this. Yeah. And so you forget sometimes you do take for granted. I try, but yeah, I do think that I could do better at it. But like you said, you want it to be organic because it's like, this is love. Right. We don't want to plan some grand gesture. And yet, you know, yeah, you do. That's how you show somebody that you really care about them. Yeah. Real love is going to have a lot more yeah. planning, intentionality. Intentionality sound, Intentionality is a great modern word. Yeah. But what it really means to a lot of people if they've used other words for it, like planning Mm -hmm. is it's like, well, this is boring. If you really cared, right. It's the opposite of spontaneity. Right. You would naturally explode with these things all the time as if like feelings are the only things we have. Feelings are one thing that we have, but gut reactions are another thing. Thoughts are another thing. Like we're, we're in motion Mm -hmm. and very fluid with a lot of different things. And so feelings need to have a place, but Sometimes, Johnny, if you don't tell your feelings where they need to go, they'll tell you where to go. And then you're just reactive. So come <sighs> I've been now. told where to go before. I'll <laughs> tell you that right now. We need we need to figure out a, a, some kind of tradition where, yeah, where people get their flowers. You need to start incorporating it, maybe into church life. Like maybe like uh, you talk about reorganizing small groups every season or whatever. Yeah. Maybe at the end of your small group season, you got you have to. Yeah give each other a blessing or go around. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think I will actually implement that because we're supposed to have encouragement and mutual encouragement happening in those groups, but yeah. at least at once a season when we all re up. Well, I just got to say, I don't feel very encouraged. No, I'm using my group's <laughs> great. That's fine. <laughs> well, maybe a lot of people don't. A lot of people are surprised. Um, like I was on another call today and someone paid me a compliment and I immediately deflected mm-hmm. and it's my friends who are Enneagram coaches and, he was just like, like only a six would find a way. He's a six too. Like that's master six work. Basically you just yeah. did to find a way yeah. to turn that compliment into something bad about yourself. Yeah. You know, and I was like, yeah, I would write the book, you know, uh, deflecting compliments and losing friends by John Driver. Yeah. Like that's you it's know, like the opposite of the Dale Carnegie. Right. And it's like a, it's like a, I think we don't, some of us don't know. It's really hard to let ourselves be loved. How to deflect compliments and repel people. There you go. <laughs> this is going to be a worst seller. I've got, well, hey, Tony, it can't get any worse. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be great. No, it's, um, I, I, I think, I think it's key. I mean, I do think, uh, so, wow. So there's a new record out. Yeah. And I know some listeners are going to roll their eyes at me. But I find comfort in some artists that I've been listening to when I, since I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, so, but, um, cause I listen to, yeah. I, I listen to some metal. I listen to a little bit of everything, Johnny. Mm-hmm. But like Stephen Curtis Chapman has a new record out. Okay. Um, and you know, they, part of the deal with that particular family is all the loss. Right. With the They've loss been through of some daughter. stuff, some challenges. They're, they're sort of like writings and, and it's not even like they're teaching you on it, but just watching them go through grief on yeah. that level. Uh, and then he writes about a lot about it. Like, again, I, I'm a content guy. You know, some people are like, it's all about the melody, you know, and, and, and he's got great melodies and all that stuff. But he's got a song that that could ring cheesy for some, but it also is kind of profound. He's basically like, um, if the world had one way to describe us, with one word to describe us, let that word be kindness. Mm-hmm. And it's like, kindness really is like a... a game changer yeah that there are just times and i think kindness is kindness in the face of unkindness is especially a game changer it's what proverb says that a harsh answer excuse me a soft answer <laughs> turns away yeah. wrath so like that means you you can only do that when wrath comes at you and that's a super i'm not good at that 
Like I generally have a reaction. Yeah. Uh, but you can actually change the environment. You can turn something into something else. Yeah, yeah. If you can get past the initial harshness or the initial wrath. Yeah, that reminds me, I was reading a, a tweet today from, it's a quote from Eugene Peterson, uh, who's great. Uh, he wrote, uh, it's odd that a religion that carries the cross as its central symbol should produce a culture of people who consider suffering, whether it comes from a broken body or broken heart, a violation of their spiritual rights. Wow. So it's kind of to that point of like, we've gone in a few generations, we've built this people that like, it's become more about you're infringing on this. So I now get to step out and be my least kind self because I have the right now. I've had my rights violated. So I get to now be the worst version of myself. It's okay to do that. It's like, it's so not okay. But yeah, we, we, we've lost our way a little bit when it comes to kindness, I think. That's it feels it feels like weakness to us. No, it really does. And there's lots of quotes from people. when it's really strength. It's like the ultimate strength. Yep, it it is. It's like rebellion in a world that's just completely about its rights to be like mm, interesting. I, I'm going to waive that. Yeah, I'm going to do the other thing. I think, and I find myself the last few months even generally I evaluate how well my spiritual life is going by the time spent yeah. with God. You know, kind of thing. Um. There was a couple days in the last month or so that lots of other people's pain like came at me in in a way that I got to be present for mm -hmm. like on a, 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 and a, just like boom 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 and I kind of felt like what have you evaluated your spiritual life not just by your devotional time or your knowledge gained those kinds of things but what if another big part or even a bigger part of that was how much you got to share in the sufferings of others, which scripturally means you've shared in the sufferings of Christ. So if you, if what you do unto another in a good way yeah. is doing unto Jesus, right? He said that if you give someone a cup of water, it's like you're giving a cup of water to Jesus. Then when someone else is sharing their hardships and you bear that with them, you actually are bearing then the sufferings of Jesus. I think we, we act like the sufferings of Jesus scripturally is only, in some martyrdom way, right. some denial of a faith expression right. or affirmation of a faith expression. Someone comes at you, they hold a gun. I mean, this is our childhood, right? Yeah. It, you know, and, and someone says, I mean, that wasn't our childhood. People talking to us about that scenario yeah. was a, a part of our childhood. And I mean, I should tell the kids all the time, it's, it's way, way less likely that someone's ever going to kill you for being a Christian. The harder part's going to be you actually living as a believer, mm -hmm. not dying as one. It sounds cliche, but it's just, it's just very true. But like, I think that there's like this joy of going, wow, I got to experience today the honor of a little just minutia of what Jesus bears with us yeah. for others. Yeah. Or we think of like, to, to the Eugene Peterson quote, we almost think of the cross as like this means to an end as a delivery, uh, deliverance from suffering. But that's not really the point. It, no. it delivers us from the the end result it saved us from death and spiritual death but suffering is like all throughout the new testament yeah the church is full of suffering and the fellowship of suffering and the fellowship of christ's suffering so somehow we've kind of it's again it's that western view where we have our creature comforts and so we've got to figure out how to make those okay you know so yeah. we we do a lot of weird uh you know mental gymnastics to resolve the early church's mindset with what we have now and pretend that it's the same. And it's really not. We've, we've, we've kind of morphed it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure you're going to find an equilibrium between the two places without, I think it's what you're seeing right now. Even when you talk about returning to liturgy or whatever, yeah, there is a sense of overlaying a modern ethic onto the ancient realities of the gospel. They're not going to line up. Uh, was it John Mark Comer in Live No Lies that talked about like, hey, the, in reality, the, the journey of Jesus was always towards a cross. If you're going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, it's always towards a cross. Like it's, it's towards more suffering, not less. That's, yeah. a, that's a hard, hard message for us because it, it butts up against the gospel message of, and there's another song on that same record with uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman. Where he talks about growing up, I was I was told um, 
every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Mm-hmm. And uh, God's got a wonderful plan for your life. And these are kind of the lines of it. He's like, and every single bit of it was true. But like, what do you do when those things don't line up? There's a whole lot of unfixables mm-hmm. in your life. And I mean, I think again, songs like that by established yeah. people in <laughs> right. in that sort of industry saying, hey, there there has to be an evolution. Yeah, it's not a Brady Bunch episode no. where it just everything's good after 30 minutes. You may, you know, that's what was wrong with Christian cinema for so long. They all had to have some lightning, you know, flip switch moment where this guy receives yeah. uh, salvation and then his entire life changes for the better. I mean, some of these disciples that Jesus uh, called to follow him, they had to go home and tell their family and their family would disown them. Yeah. You know, like they knew what they were doing. Uh, it's like the founders signing the Declaration of Independence. They were signing their death warrant. Right. A lot of what they knew. Of, yeah. yeah. It's a declaration of war. It's a declaration. If we lose, this will be treason. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, there's a heaviness to it. And, uh, but yeah, we do. We, to me, it's about, cause I've experienced a lot of suffering in my life. I feel like maybe not, you know, in the grand scheme of things, but I do feel like I've experienced some things. And to me, it's not about like a deliverance from suffering. It's a, it gives meaning to suffering. Yeah. You know, perspective to suffering. No, there's not suffering without like, uh, it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't, it doesn't come without end, but also it's like, there's a, there's something to it. Right, uh, I can see something being built because of it. Uh, more times than not. Sometimes you're just like, wow, this doesn't make sense to me. And I'm, I'm going to have some questions about this. But then, you know, I see a lot of things where I go, man, I could see being really mad in the moment at that and having a lot of questions. And now, 20 years later, I go, I see what was going on there. You yeah. Know? You can't know that in the moment, though. I don't know. No, and you can't know without continuing forward. Yeah. You know, Sadie and I were talking about that last night on a difficult situation. We were just driving. And I was like, hey, this could be a moment to quit or this can be a, a moment to build some inner yeah. strength and, and she was like i want to quit <laughs> thank you for the option well and she did say she was like yeah but it doesn't feel like i'm building mm-hmm. inner fortitude i was like yeah that's the thing with it it won't feel like that in the moment it can only it can only become that over time i mean there are some things i've stuck with over time yeah that you i mean i'm talking years and years and years uh that they they don't feel like anything in the moment but looking back stacked you know one upon another, yeah, they become greater than the sum of their parts. I mean, you know, if you just look at a brick, mm-hmm. it's just a brick. You know, you keep stacking them, you eventually have a house. You know, I think that's how it works. <sighs> I wasn't a civil engineer as much as don't you build the frame first? I don't know. I just been putting bricks. The, in the inner mud. fortitude, as it were. I built my house on sand. You just stacked a bunch of bricks, right? I didn't even put mortar on them. It was this. I didn't know. My whole family lives in danger every yeah, day. This is uh, you live inside a Jenga tower. We, <laughs> Good luck, my we're friend. One stiff wind away from destruction. So uh, you talk about cleaning out your garage, and it made me think because we I started working in my office, and my office is piled and piled full of like just junk mail and just every everything that we. I was, was like the, inspired brilliance. But it became no. the catch all for everything that we didn't want in the other rooms of the house. Gotcha. So it just became like just piled up. And to where I couldn't even get work done in there. I was like, I can't, there's nowhere for me to be. There's nowhere for me to sit things down. Yeah. All these, every surface area is covered with things. And so I said, we got to work on this. So we did. We started working on it. But I have a fear of accumulating things. Uh-huh. And I think it's because I was raised around clutter. Yeah. And Curry was definitely raised around clutter. Her parents are pack rats. Not to the hoarder's point. Like it's not unclean, but it's just, they have every knickknack, every... Patty whack. <laughs> Every <laughs> give a dog a bone. They do. It's like just t- there's tunnels in their house of just pathways and stuff. Yeah. Her house growing up of like you can get to where you need to get, but everything else is going to be stacked up papers and books and yeah. random things. There's nowhere to sit a cup of coffee. Like it's yeah. just everything's covered. And so, but it's funny that I'm, I grew up less around that, but I'm the more concerned about accumulating. I think it's because. Part of it's like, I don't want to have a consumer mindset of like, let's just go get these things that I think will make me happy. And then, and, you know, you just like, they you, they suffocate you. Yeah. That's what you feel like. 
And so if I feel us starting to accumulate, I'm like, we need to give some of this stuff away. We need to whatever. We're not, we've not used this. Let's, and she's more like, what are you freaking out about? She'll, she'll challenge me on some of that stuff. But I've noticed an accumulation is starting to happen. We're in an accumulation season again. And it's starting to panic me. So that's when you do the spring clean. You're like, all right, let's throw this away. Let's get this. And like, we got rid of a bed. We went to a bed that's lowered the floor because Toby couldn't jump up in our right. bed. So now we have this low, but we, our whole old bed frame is still like part of it's in the garage. Part of it's leaned up against the wall on the opposite wall of yeah. our bedroom. Because how do you give away a bed frame? Or how do you throw it away? You know, like you can't give away a bed because it's like you'll rent a bed in a hotel for $150 a night that a thousand people have slept on, but you can't give away a mattress to Goodwill or a box springs. Can you take a mattress or bed to the uh, convenience center, the dump? I don't know, but we're going to try, but it's, I don't have a truck either. I've got a hatchback. You want to know why? You don't want to know what people do. It's so much. They're on the sides of the road. They just leave them everywhere, right? Because people just can't. Find a place well, I don't want to be that person, so we've just burn stored it. them. But where do you burn it? Your backyard. No, burn I live mattress. in an HOA. <sighs> You're gonna get me kicked out of my neighborhood. Burnt mattress. That's what you said. What you said. <laughs> friend, you my friend Brent Mathis. We used to call him burnt, burnt mattress. mattress. Yeah. But anyway, I just am thinking about like accumulate. But but we it happened again. Christmas, like we're hard to buy for because if we want something, we'll just go get it. Right. Oh, I already got that. But my wife bought me something for Christmas. Like I saw a charge and I go, is this fraudulent? I have to call her every now and again. Like, do you, did you? It's not so hard to surprise And then she told me, she goes, it's your Christmas present. And I go, she goes, but it won't be here for Christmas. I go, okay. It's coming from Hong Kong or something. So I knew, I already knew it was going to be some weird something that she saw online. Wow. So it came last night. Mm. And my wife is my, I have an issue. I I have a bit about it, about how I clean my ears every day. And basically Q-tips are now just devices to scratch my brain. (laughs) I re I put the Q tip in until I touch my brain. I twist it till I go cross eyed. I pull it out. Pray there's not blood. That's every day. Even when doctors look in my ear, they're like, "Looks good in here." Like there's nothing in my ear. <laughs> they can see through to the other side. I, yeah, they, <laughs> I, I can see what you're thinking. They swab that. I swab the heck out of my ear. So my wife bought me. Have you seen these things where it's like a little? It's a. It's a camera on the end of a thing guess what i have one coming (laughs) it tethers to your phone mine hasn't got here yet yeah so (laughs) we i was like let's see first of all let's see if this is junk because the app that it comes with had one star reviews oh dear and i was like all right this is gonna not work at all but it does work so i'm like looking in my ear last night my hairy nasty middle-aged man ear i john i could not find any wax in my ear (laughs) there's no wax but it's got like a little plastic scoopy guy scoopy. on the end of it where you can just, you yeah. know, find it and retrieve whatever. See, I'm not, my ears are filled. Yeah. And I can't get them out. But so. as you're going, like you've never seen that view. It's a weird view to look in your own ear hole. Mm. And I just thought, <laughs> I didn't know. I don't know what I expected. I don't know what I expected, but part of me was like, um. What if there's like a tiny guy going, hey, like just <laughs> get me a out of here. random, <laughs> that would scare, Money. yeah, like a, what if there's a bug in there? We don't know. Right. Till you look in your ear, you yeah. don't know what, you don't, I did not expect that amount of hair. I'll say that. Oh. It's not coming out. I try to trim that area because, you know, middle-aged men, you're going to have, but I was like, inside there, there's a lot of hair. And uh, it was a weird thing that, but I thought, you know, it really is. It's an odd, that, that was my Christmas gift from yeah. my wife. Because we just, we, yeah. did, we didn't really do gifts this year. I was like, let's go somewhere. You know, so we went on a trip or whatever. We're planning a trip. But it's like, she bought me the let's investigate your ear camera. Wow. That was our, wow. it's romantic in a way. That's, yeah, that's what marriage. She's trying to take care of my, what Mary. do you call it, ear health? Your uh, co- uh, cochlear. Cochlear. Your cochlear health. There you go. Yeah, I'm about to go see a... I've heard wax is actually good. Really? Like wax serves a purpose. My ears... You don't want too much. Mm, I'll preach. But there's supposed to be like a balance, a homeostasis that's achieved by having some wax. I can't deal though. I I have... I've got itchy ears, just like the the early church. Church at Laodicea or whatever. I don't remember who it was. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I I think I, I have too much. You do? Yeah, and I can't. Well, where do you get this thing? It's You're going to be able to 
clean some house. I think I'm going to go see an audio. We have an audio. I feel like we're experience. grossing people out, but yeah, it's sorry, just guys. earwax. Guys, hey, if you're grossed out, this is adulthood, man. What do you want? I mean, adulthood is being excited that you get to scrape wax out of your yeah, ears. Like your spouse gave it to you, and you're like, this was the most romantic gift. I get to ever. see it happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. Interesting. But now here's another. It's I can't another, believe you had it so clean. But it's one more gadget that I thought this will end up in a drawer somewhere. Right, because now you know there's no reason to clean your ears ever. Like we were cleaning the office out, and there was a thing. There's a device that was in a box. It was unopened, and it said, "What is called two in one adapter." And I look at it, and it's got Chinese writing all over it. And I opened the little booklet to see what it does. It was like the size of a postage stamp. It had a switch on it. It had a button that had power that said power. I push the power button, and it starts blinking. I'm like, "This is trying to connect to Bluetooth. What does it do, though?" Like, what is it Bluetoothing? So, and I could not remember what I bought it for. Well, just connect it and see. I did. So then I, it had a headphone jack. I put in headphones and it basically connected my phone to that device. So it's basically, if you don't have Bluetooth headphones, if you have wired headphones, it acts as a receiver. Gotcha. But I was like, when would I have bought this and why would I have bought this? There are Bluetooth headphones. What, what did you buy it before Bluetooth headphones? There's no way. I don't remember. And I probably spent 30 bucks on this thing that I thought, well, I'll get this. It'll make my life better. And I literally did not even open the package. Wow. That's that's what I mean by accumulating. It's got to stop, John. <laughs> I'm out of control. Yeah. The other day, though, see, I've tried to, been, I've tried to throw things out, too. Yeah. Until the other day, my wife's shoulder was hurting, and we have, like, this shoulder. You're like, throw it out. <laughs> she did throw it. She threw out her shoulder. <laughs> she threw out her shoulder. She needed to plug up like this. She has this cold, it's this thing her dad had, or she had one from shoulder surgery. And it is that like a little tank. Uh-huh. And it, it's like the thing you get in the hospital. It oh, wraps yeah. around your shoulder and it, you put ice in it and it, you know. Keeps we, cold air on the joint. We could not find the power adapter okay. to plug it in. That's well, I, the fear of every man is if I throw this yes. box of adapters away, I'm going to need one. And I'm one. pretty certain the last time I purged the garage, I had a box of adapters. <sighs> I was like, you know what? No. And I threw it away. And I searched the house, the garage, the drawers, uh, everything. You'll never find it. Couldn't find it. And, I was and like, you're afraid of plugging the wrong thing in with the wrong polarity, and then like the thing just sets on fire. I'm not afraid of that. If I you're got, off by two amps. If I could have forced a plug into there, I would have done it and and just let let bygones hey, be bygones. good luck. Go ahead and fall asleep, yeah. sweetie. <laughs> I, hope everything's... The ice will probably put out the fire. No, but I and I was like, well, see, this is why yeah. I hold on to things. Right. Uh, but that was... It justifies that hoarder mentality. But we did just get on Amazon and order like some universal plug and it'll be here in like a day. Okay. So there's the, the other way now. For like 10 bucks, I can fix the problem. Yeah. Uh, or you can hold on to everything. I think Amazon is probably diminishing hoarding. You think? Because it's like, look, if I need to get something else, I can have it delivered overnight yeah, right. for free. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So people are more likely to throw away now? I think that hoarding is like a a thing. I don't even know what it comes from. I bet there's therapists that could talk to it. Like, Obviously, the last generation of hoarders could point to a scarcity mentality that came out of World War II. Right. Because, you know, we... You know, if you pull a nail out of a board, you straighten it with a hammer and put it in a tin can in the garage. So you might you might need those nails. Right. I can get that person. If that person hoards, I'm like, I'm not going to talk my dad out of hoarding. Curry's yeah. dad. This it, that's that ship has sailed. He is going to. Yeah. He's going to hang on to stuff. If he gets a hole in his socks, he's going to figure out how to fix the socks. Maybe. Yeah. You know, or they're his favorite socks. Whereas I'd be like, Dad, it's a dollar. Yeah, Laura's we'll grandfather would yeah. would wash out and reuse like plastic Ziploc mm-hmm. baggies. Yep. Yeah, yeah. What's the point of wasting it? Uh, Curry's dad currently has his iPhone, which I bought for him, and he is using. Thank God, he has it in a Ziploc bag that is like all the air is pulled out of it and it's zipped closed. And he said, "This is that's his waterproof." I go, Dad, they make waterproof cases, though. I could get... He goes, no, no, this is just as good. So he is carrying yeah. around. A it's got all bag. these floppy edges around it. In, He's got a $1,000 phone in the yes. baggie. Yeah. Yeah. And there's... Listen, that's okay. Yeah. It's even a little charming. In some ways. But if you did it, I'd be like, hey, John, we're in public. <laughs> so I think it, there's a generational aspect to hoarding. Sure. But then I think there's something like there's a break where what makes people hold on to things versus throw them away. And some people throw away, like you said, some people throw away too much stuff, then they're like, they got to go buy it again. Yeah, it's a utility thing for me. It's not an emotional thing. Now, occasionally, I will say this, we 
my, I had my dad's old GMC Denali. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he passed, mom needed a different car where she could get in easier than climbing up into that thing. And she was going to trade it. They were going to give her like next to nothing. Yeah. But we love old GMCs because they run forever. We already had one. We had a GMC, not Denali, but just a Yukon. Mm-hmm. So that one was an O four. And no, sorry, that one was O two. Well, Dad's was an O four. Mm-hmm. I mean, Johnny, he was you're, a full two years. You're moving on up. Younger. Yeah. Then this was, mind you, 2018. And so, so yeah. we. But I thought, well, you know what? You can't buy a Denali anymore for less than like eighty five thousand dollars. And right. it's got all the stuff. So I put some money into that. Yeah. And I fixed it up and I got it painted. And I did the whole deal. And for me, it was just a car opportunity because I thought, well, when can I ever spend this amount of money and drive around in Denali? And it's very comfortable and all those things. It was fine. But to me, it had no sentimental real. Mom would even ask, like, hey, what do you, you know, I'm glad you get to d- yeah. drive your dad's car and stuff. You know, I was like, well, you it's know. It's not like it's a classic or anything that you want to no. hang on to because it's a 62 Firebird or something. Right. But I thought I had no sentimental attachment to yeah. it. Until like finally this year, we were like, "Hey, the air is not working in the summer, right?" All those things, mm-hmm. and so we went to the Jeep dealership. Yeah, and we were trading it in, and she was getting a Jeep, and I had to go clean it out. Yeah, I cleaned it out, and as I'm walking away, like I had a thing. Like, yeah, I was like, "Where is it?" It's like the finality of it. When feelings hit me outside of my intellect, uh-huh. they're very surprising to me because I kind of feel like I can predict everything coming. Right, it's such a Stupid. Or you can overcome it with your mind, like, no, this is not. Right, there's no reason to think this yeah. way, is what my brain says first. But then I'm like, what? I can't get away with that pit in my stomach feeling, mm-hmm. you know, that is coming. And I was like, well, yeah, there's a connection to your dad here that you didn't realize this yeah. car held. So I think holding on to some things uh, occasionally for me will do that. Yeah. Um, do you keep uh, every card? Because we threw away some cards, because we had like a stack of cards and stuff. I and Curry to. goes, I wrote you this card. Do you want to keep it? And she's holding the card. And I got to say to her, no, throw that card away. <laughs> but but what you said uh, to me back then means nothing. But at some point, like she just goes, this is, I don't remember even write what I wrote in this card. But you know how I fix it? What? If I when in doubt, I just take a picture of it and then throw it away. Okay. And now it's in my, it's still in my records. Of, yeah. And someday looking through it, I'll see. In the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. I do that a lot. Old documents and stuff. Hey, that's fine. That's a good o- idea. Old things that Sadie drew. Mm-hmm. Hey, we don't have but to it keep meant, the It meant something to you in the moment. That's the thing, like a card. I don't know. Card's tough. There was even a couple like gift books that she got me that were like little like, here's a funny pictures of animals, but they say, you know, sentimental things. And she got me a couple of those. And she was just like, ah, what do you want? Are we ever going to look at this book again? I yeah. go, I can't imagine a scenario where I would look at that book again. And I think it's okay in marriage when you can be honest yeah. and say that. Like, hey, yeah. this is what it was. But I wasn't like trying to get her to throw it away. She was saying to me, is it okay if we throw this book away? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, there's too many books in the world anyway. We were just real honest about how we feel about books. Uh, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I agree. It's interesting, though, all this talk of going back in the past. Yeah. It reminds me uh, of a segment that we do. <laughs> <laughs> we got to work on your segues. Uh, it's a segment we do called Talk About Then. That's right, John. That's This Week in History. Mm. And uh, I got a couple of good ones for you. All right. January 4th, 1847. Can you guess what this one's going to be? 1847 is... What if I said the name Samuel Colt to you? Samuel Colt. Is this about the gun? He made his first sale to the U.S. government. Oh. Captain Samuel Walker of the Texas Rangers had not the baseball team. Colt 45? Had just used Colt revolvers and was impressed by them when his 15-man unit defeated 70 Comanches in Texas. Uh, he placed an order with the Colt with Colt for a thousand revolvers for use by the Rangers in the Mexican-American War. Interesting. So he had this military victory, and he was like, "There's something to these guns." You know, I'm not a gun guy, so I got yeah. nothing. But I remember Colt. I know Colt is a revolver yeah you know interestingly enough that's a war people really have forgotten about or they get confused with the spanish american war which is like 1890 yeah i'm confused by that yeah but i thought they were the same no the, and, and they also get it confused with the alamo 
which was actually in Texas's war for independence. Oh, it was in the Mexican-American War. Not the Mexican-American War. I did not know that. But the Mexican-American War, what's interesting about it, and you said 1847, is you're you're 13 years or so, 14 years before the beginning of the Civil War. The Mexican-American War is when almost all of the generals that Mm. you know of, North and South, fought together. Because it was all the Union still in the Mexican-American War. So like it's a war that Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant fought in on the same side. So let's let that sink in. Like that was where they and they almost all went to West Point together as well. And they used Colts. At some they point. used Colt revolvers. Yeah. Which Ulysses S. Grant, by the way, was a master equestrian. Oh really? I think it was in that war that he became a something he there was a battle happening that he needed to get a message to the other side of the field. Yeah. He did one of those like get on the horse and sloop down on the side. Away oh yeah! From the, so they can't see you and like rode that way. To, to I do that, message. but when I'm trying to get on the horse, I can't <laughs> just, get up any off. higher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen. It just takes times. off and then you ride inside saddle. <laughs> All right, John. Here's one that just it just it hits at our upbringing, and you'll remember it. Oh, uh, even though you're five years younger than me, four and a half years younger than me, uh, feels like less. January fourth, nineteen eighty seven. Oral Roberts announces God will call me home. If I don't raise four and a half million dollars in three months, you remember this? Is this when he went to the tower and locked himself away? At the end of, uh, I think he went on TV. I don't remember if he went to a tower. At one point, he went up into a tower. I thought on the campus. I don't remember, himself. but he said, "God will call me home." It was a, it was one of those things where televangelists are raising money every day. We can't, you know, yeah. the budget just to get this out here. We're spreading the good word, and then it got crazier and crazier. And he literally set this goal of if we don't, if I don't reach four and a half million in three months, God's told me. He's going to kill me, basically. And uh, he declared his goal, but that God had told him he now had to raise a total of $8 million, uh, at the end of the three months. So at the end of three months, he said, look, now it's $8 million. Wow. Uh, so God upped the ante. And he said, or I'm going to call you home in a year. So that's the difference. And uh, do you want to, I don't, I did not remember this part of the story. Do you oh. remember what he raised? $5 million. 9.1. And how much longer did he live? I do not remember when Oral Roberts passed. I don't That's know. a tough one. My commentary on this one is... Yeah. I'm, I'm going through the queue in my head. It's a weird one for me because like I could say, oh, you know, whatever. But the main thing I remember is it was the, one of the first times I was ever dealing... Because what I would have been, uh, 13. And I was raised in this tradition of, you know, whatever. What do you want to call a full gospel tradition of, uh, you know televangelists were not something that I saw as charlatans. I did not think of them that way. I did not eye roll at Pat Robertson at that time in my life. My mom supported the 700 Club. Yeah. So this is one of the first times I remember having a whiplash moment of people outside of my sphere of belief having something to point at that said, something's wrong here. And I had no real defense for it. Yeah. So that was a, it was a, for me, it was a real touchstone moment where I went and I start not started to question God, but you start to question like, okay, this feels like somebody that's just being manipulative and yeah. I don't have a defense. When somebody comes and says, this is why I don't believe in God. I don't know what to do with this person because I have a hard time with this one too. I can't just be like, well, you got to trust. Right. I didn't trust it. Right. We so, didn't, and we didn't have a lot of tools for, um, holding our own. Yeah, ideologies accountable to to their stated ideals, right? You know what I'm saying, like so. Especially in that tradition, there was less accountability because it was like the anointed man of yeah. God is this oracle, and look what he says goes. And if we're going to speak against, we're speaking against God if we say this. It's yeah. like speaking against the prophet Isaiah or something. Yeah, I told someone the other day, like like the the that's where things got out of whack and can get out of whack with any of us is like the gospel is an upside down kingdom. Mm-hmm. So if you find yourself above the rules that are acceptable for everyone else because you're in leadership, like you actually should be more, and I hate to use the word rules. Yeah. You should be more uh, attuned. So if, if the, if the highest ideal of the gospel is humility and servitude, then you should be the, the one most humble yeah. and serving, not, you know, and I'm not, here's the hard part. Like, I don't think we can question Oral Roberts sincerity. Like that's something we're not going to know unless he came out and talked about it. And sincerity does not make it right. Yeah. It actually makes it sad to me. How many times have I done things sincerely? Well, I mean, it'd almost be different if he said, God told me 
that my ministry is losing effectiveness and I need to feed four and a half million people in the next three months. That That's been, not what he said. He didn't even say, this is where the money's going to go that right. I know of. It was just like, I got to raise this huge amount of money that there's no accountability for. And if I don't get it, then you guys are going to be responsible. He basically, he's almost putting it on the audience. You're going to be responsible for my death if you don't give. Yeah, and very, a lot of people that were giving are on fixed incomes. It's really, yeah. to me, I'm, I'm not going to hedge my bet on it. To me, it's super gross, and I don't feel bad about feeling like it's super gross. No, I don't either. Yeah. No, I, I, what I feel bad for is people in my life in those days who may have not recognized it yeah. was gross and now feel foolish. That's or, the hard or part. Or feel taken. You That's know? the hard part when you realize, when you start feeling foolish about something, and you go deeper down the rabbit hole because you can't, your brain can't let you feel that feeling. That's what cognitive dissonance is. I'm trying to hold these two opposing beliefs and that tension that I feel is the cognitive dissonance. So, you know, you know, if you voted for a guy or you uh, believed in a guy and then he shows himself to be something else, you're more likely to dig in deeper yeah. because of that. And I just wish it wasn't always that way. I wish we could grow out of some of that. Yeah. And I, I do look at the generation that, you know, that raised us. And I do sometimes, like those who are listening, and there are a lot, uh, not just the podcast, I mean, but like listening to what's happening in the yeah. culture. I don't want them to feel like everything they ever did, yeah, was always wrong, right? Like you want to go, hey, you know, there were there were charlatans, and there were people maybe who were sincere, but still ended up the same yeah. outcome as charlatans. Sure, it's gross and all those things, and the fact that that system was in place. Hey, let's make sure we don't have that. Where that system did damage, let's try to bring healing. Yeah. Let's where that system you can reform. Yeah. Where that system made mistakes, we should call it out and we should repent and make it right. Yeah. And let's build a different system moving forward. You Agreed. Know? And I don't agree with people who just say, yeah, take the worst of something and say, this proves that it's not real because here's the worst of it. I always try to remember the quote that like religion, uh, is like a public swimming pool. Uh, a lot of the noise is coming from the shallow end. Nice. Like we, we do, we elevate voices that we shouldn't sometimes. Yeah. And then those voices are used against us by people who don't want to believe what we believe, but it can't, it doesn't always discount the beliefs. You've got to look at so much good that's been done. So I don't necessarily, I just think that that is a huge misstep in the history of, yeah. of the culture we were raised in. So, yeah, well, all right, here's one, a couple more born January 4th, 1903, a German worker George Elsner. Do you know who George Elsner is, John? He attempted to assassinate Adolf Hitler in oh. 1939 by placing a bomb near a podium where Hitler was to give a speech. Do you know this story? Yeah, because this is, uh, it's called, uh, it's the one with Tom Cruise. They made a movie about it. Uh, right. Uh, v Val Valkyrie. Valkyrie. Yeah. So this is, I did not know some of the details of this. It's pretty crazy. So Hitler's going to give a speech. This guy knew it. And it was his yearly speech given on the anniversary of his... Uh, no, because Valkyrie was about them. They were in some secret... Okay. Yeah. This was given on the anniversary of his uh, board of 1923 Beer Hall Putsch. Anyway, Elzer had built a bomb. This is great. With a 144-hour timer. He then spent several weeks secretly hollowing out a cavity in a stone pillar behind the speaker's platform where he knew Hitler planned on giving his speech. After installing the bomb, he set it to explode at 9.20 p.m., which would be halfway through Hitler's planned speech. This is all dependent on this 144-hour <laughs> window. And so it's crazy, the, the accuracy of it. And then, But here's what happened. Due to a forecast of fog preventing him from flying back in the morning, Hitler moved his speech from 8.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. and shortened it from two hours to about one hour so that he could catch a train. He finished the speech and left the building eight minutes before the bomb went off. And here's the other part. Eight people were killed and over 60 others were injured, but Hitler was unharmed. Elzer was then captured that night, spent the next five years in a Nazi concentration camp where he was executed less than a month before Germany surrendered. That, that's a, that's got to be what the movie's about, right? It's got to be about that. That's a crazy story. No, no, the movie's, no. It, it's like, Wasn't this story in Bonhoeffer, this, too? I want to say Bonhoeffer talked about this. I don't know about this. It's been a while since I heard Bonhoeffer. Anyway, crazy story. Yeah, wow. 144 hour bomb. You got to know, like. Mm hmm. <sighs> Like, no one could ever bomb us because we record at different times. Right. We It's random. I you go, couldn't be like, oh. is Thursday good? So if somebody was planning on hollowing out this couch. That's a, how would you hollow? First of all, it's a pretty, I'm pretty self-centered to think that I could be an assassination target. I think that's really the key. Here's the deal. It's all about words. You're a words person, okay? Uh. If you, 
the, the words assassinate versus murder, okay? Right. It says a lot about what you are. It's really money, okay? The same thing with like Interesting. crazy and eccentric. Right. You know, if you're, if you're spouting, you know, just insane things, right. but you're loaded, what an eccentric old coot. Yeah. Versus what a crazy person. Or so, ag- aggressive versus assertive. I hope that yeah. I make enough money in my life. To be assassinated. To have, to, to have someone say about me, can you believe that that eccentric old man was assassinated? <laughs> I hope that, I hope that's what it comes to for me, Johnny. I, we can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's one that's got. Uh, this is an interesting one. General Tom Thumb, who was kind of a circus performer, uh, P.T. Barnum discovered uh, a little person, three and a half foot tall. His marriage to uh, Lavinia Warren, who was two and a half foot tall herself, made front page news. Front page news, and had ten thousand guests. Wow. This is like when circus performers were like a big part of culture. Yeah. It was more of a ingrained in our culture. I did not know this part, though. The wedding couple was then received by U.S. President Abraham Lincoln at the White House. Wow. That just tells you, like, that's insane, right? Yeah, that's a lot of... Uh, that's, that's, that's a lot of fanfare Yeah, for, you know, whatever. Whatever he was to the you culture. You are a notable couple yes. to be received. All right, and finally, John, a couple of uh, birthdays. Hmm. Born January 4th, Sorel book do you know who sorel book is I don't. he was on a show called the dukes of hazard oh and he played a character named boss hog oh wow do you know what boss hog's first name actually was though i forgot about this oh. you'll love it no jefferson davis hog no was way. his real name oh, they wow. went with boss yeah to take a little of the edge off hey speaking of by the way hold that thought yeah remember the whole lee lee victory parkway thing yeah so I was at Lee Victory Parkway last night uh-huh. when they told me the Starbucks I was riding at shuts down at seven now mm-hmm. instead of nine. So I had to go find another Starbucks because I had two hours. So I'm driving it's right across the street. And r- no, when I what what is one street over? Okay, was General Forest Circle. Okay, Nathan Bedford Forest Circle. So th- if Lee Victory. Lee it's Victory not, is just a dude. It's just named, a dude named Lee Victory. There happens to be though a street named after General Nathan Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest, yeah. Like so, it's a it's a reasonable it's a reasonable uh, assumption that it's about Lee General right, Lee. This whole thing's like no, there's no way. It's just a guy. No, no, no. What I'm if saying, it's a cover story? The you think they made up a guy named Lee Victory I just don't know. to? I know that Curry says otherwise, but uh, Curry's never lied to me. Oh, that's what you think. All right, uh, last, all right one, birthday. Last one. This is a death, notable death. Uh, Albert Camus was a French Nobel winning writer, yeah. philosopher. Famous quote. This is, I think this is an apt quote for us, John. Don't walk behind me. I may not lead. Don't walk in front of me. I may not follow. Just walk beside me and be my friend. Wow. Hmm? Isn't that... I wish you would take that to heart just once. I was once. About thinking I wish you would. Like, I'm sick of you walking... I'm sick of walking in front of you and trying to me. have you think i'm leading it's yeah because i'm not following i'm just confused why you're zigging and zagging walk beside me be my friend hey who said that who whose joke is it because you know what i keep bringing up all these jokes from yeah. our childhood and you're like that wasn't really mine and you're like you keep devastating me because uh-huh. uh, you just misled me and lied all those that's years. not true John. Um, but the joke was uh if you're gonna walk a mile Oh, right. I don't know. Nobody knows. That's like, I would call that a street joke. It's a street joke? Yeah. Well, go ahead and tell that. It's uh, before you criticize a man, walk a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do criticize him, you're a mile away and you have his shoes. <laughs> Roy told a story. I still laugh at that. I need to tell, because we're talking about our buddy, Pastor Roy, who yeah. is retiring from children's ministry. And he has the funniest stories because he was an actual carny. He worked in a carnival. And he had just the funniest street jokes and stories. And I just, there's one that I remember he said, that his dad picked up a hitchhiker. They picked up hitchhikers all the time, yeah. which is part of what they did. He said they picked up a hitchhiker, and the guy only had one shoe. And so they get going. They pick up the guy. He gets in, and they get going five miles down the road. And his dad finally goes, all right, I got to ask, did you lose your shoe? And he goes, nope, found one. <laughs> that <laughs> is amazing. That's great. It's all about perspective, John. Isn't it, though? You know? And you know what, listener? We hope that your perspective of the podcast <laughs> has brought you to a place of joy mm. in the new year. We hope you found a shoe, yeah. as it were. Maybe you're thinking, 
I feel like I'm limping through this thing. Maybe the limp is good because you found something. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? At least one of your feet doesn't hurt. Yeah. The metaphor has its limits. Yes. But uh, but you know what doesn't have its limits, Johnny? The worldwide interwebs. That's right. And you can find all the archived episodes on talkaboutthatpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Anywhere. The podcast store. Yeah. Uh, you can also, you should go check out Johnny's comedy. If you haven't watched his two dry bar specials or his Amazon special, you should go to johnnyw.com. Those, those are all available. I think they're even on YouTube now. So yeah, you can just type me into YouTube. Yeah. Check out his link tree. There's all kinds of things out there. Uh, John has books on Amazon. Over 30,000 books. Guys, it's written. unbelievable. I'm very so many tomes <laughs> full of knowledge and language. and Yeah. Uh, mostly in English. Mostly. Uh, no, John's great. And uh, new books coming out. And some new projects you're working on now that are a little bit on the Board down low right now. Snail Can't talk about a little brain. non-compete, non-disclosure. You know what I mean? Uh, none of that. All that was nonsense. Okay. I do have a pretty exciting pitch coming up. Yeah. That I'll, if it happens, then mm-hmm. I'll talk about it. If not, then never shall be spoken of. But Is it like on Shark Tank? Um, no, but it is a, it is like a little... A little beyond my norm. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, to me, when you told me about it, it's like a bucket listy kind of a thing. Yeah. I'm excited for you. Yeah. So like if you could, if you could think through the vagueness, maybe say a prayer for old John. Yeah. In the next few days. Please so, send him up. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, but we also uh, are so grateful to be a part of the Life Audio Network and want to thank them for their partnership with us on this podcast. You can go to lifeaudio.com and you'll find dozens of other podcasts and their network they got all kinds of shows about parenting or they got bible study shows pastoral shows lots of cool stuff happening at lifeaudio.com mm-hmm. yeah hey guys thank you for taking the time uh be on the lookout for some bonus content that's going to be released pretty soon yeah uh man you get more talk about that we're gonna make a little uh, miniature episodes that we're gonna release from time to time yeah for those of you people who uh want a little bit more throughout your week just a little bit more Mm. just a bit more hey we'll give you just a bit more on the regular episodes next week on talk about that Mm -hmm.